Heavenly Father, on this most wonderful of days, we thank you, Lord, that you sent your Son to save us and set us free. Thank you for the victory of cross over the evil and death. Lord, of all we ask for peace in this disheartened world, filled with anguish and anxiety. We pray for those who suffer pain. We hold up to you those who are in trouble. Grant your peace to them, O Lord. We pray for the families, especially, Father, for we remember Mr. Arthur's family, Ms. Sarafina's and Ms. Mr. Arthur's family. Lord, we remember the souls that are departed from this world. But yes, Lord, they are rested with you in peace. Lord, especially we pray for their lives. We remember them. And we know, Lord, there is a lot of impact in the families for their losses, O oh Lord. Please bring comfort and peace to those who are mourning, O oh Lord. May they find hope in you. Lord, today, especially we pray for our church 
We commit a church into your hands, O oh Lord, especially the members, the pastorate committee, the church leaders. Bless them and guide them, O oh Lord. Bless each one of them. Yes, Lord, you have delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the light. Yes, Lord, you have given light in our lives. We pray for all the students, O oh Lord, especially those who are writing their exams. Fill with your grace, O oh Lord, and help them to write the exams well as they continue to study and find their way in this world, O oh Lord. Lord, we commit our church into your mighty hands. Bless each one of them, especially as we plan to visit the church site. Bless each one of us with the, your travel mercies and especially protection from this heat, O oh Lord, as we continue to worship. Be with us, bless us, and let your light of resurrection fill, with, fill in our hearts. Amen. Happy Easter Sunday to all of you. Happy Easter. It is such a joy to gather here in this manner to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yes, once again, welcome to our Easter Sunday worship service. Um, Yes, as we ponder upon our lives, it is very true to say that we live in a fallen world. The challenges that we face is real. The, difficult, the difficulties that we come through are sometimes very challenging. And each passing day, our challenges seem to be more numerous. And there could be among, in, among us as well who could be searching for someone to come and lead you out from your difficulties, from your challenges. But today, deep down in our hearts, we know for sure that there is something much more than all these things. There is not only an answer, but the answer is our Lord Jesus Christ, the answer to everything and for all of us. And because of his work, because of his love for us, today we're celebrating this Resurrection Sunday. Let me read out a scripture verse for all of us from Acts chapter 4, verses 10 to 11. It says, Then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. And this man stands before you, before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And this is the word of God. And as we forward with our, move forward with our service, let us focus our eyes and also give our hearts to God so that we will be able to experience his resurrected power uh, afresh again uh, this very day. At this time, I would also like to welcome our friends who are here for this for in NCF Pune for the first time. Uh, I would like to acknowledge your presence. Is there, if anyone is worshiping with NCF Pune for the first time, kindly stand wherever you are seated. Anyone who are here for the first time, please be, yes, uh, we have a few friends here. Kindly stand, please uh, keep, uh, please remain standing. Yes, we have a cross connection and also a connect card in order to connect you and also for you to know better about our church we are handing over to you church shall we welcome them please be seated we are thrilled that you are here with us to celebrate this easter sunday and we look forward to worship with you even in days to come. Church, we will continue to worship the Lord by collecting of 
offerings, tithes. So I request the ushers to come forward. Our Heavenly Father, we come before your presence at this time with thanksgiving in our hearts, knowing that you are hearing us. Thank you for giving us this precious opportunity to call upon you. Thank you for your grace that is always sufficient. O Lord of mercy, accept our offerings. May it be used for the extension of your kingdom. We thank you for the grace of giving. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, Amen. Church. On this auspicious day, we have a song presentation from Ms. Kinabo Jimomi. Uh, Ms. Kinabo hails from Dimapur and she is one of the many working youths in our church as she is currently working at EXL. She is also one of the core leaders as she leads the ushering task group. So with no further ado, I request Ms. Kinabo to take her time.
very good morning to you all. This morning, the scripture which I'm going to read is taken out from Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, verse 13 to 35. On the road to Emmaus. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk alone? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of, one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priest and other rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it, just as the woman had said. But him they did not see. He said to them, How foolish are you and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disap disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the word of God. Now I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Lano Jamer. He is the vice principal of Union Biblical Seminary uh, teaching New Testament. Uh, he serves NCF Pune as the chairman of the pastoral team. Now uh, I would like to give this time to Pastor uh, Dr. Lanu Jamer. I bring <clears throat> Esther greetings to each and every one of you. Indeed, the Lord has risen. And I thank God for this wonderful privilege to share from his word on this wonderful and joyous occasion. The very reason why we are here today to worship him, the very reason why NCF exists, the very reason why we, from different culture, nations, and background, come to worship the living God. I was checking on the internet to seize the world greatest events that has taken place in the history of humankind. And surprisingly, no one mentions the resurrection. In one website, the birth of Jesus is mentioned in number 16. But the world wars, the landing of the man on the moon, the discovery of penicillin and all those things comes in the least, but not the resurrection of Jesus. For the world, 
this is a non even but for us believers this is the most significant event that has happened in the the whole history of humankind because based on this you know our future our destiny is already determined the future of the universe of the cosmos is determined evil is defeated death has been defeated and triumphed over and so this is a very very significant event for each and every one of us and i believe it's the same for every one of us uh, seated here today for christians this is the bedrock the foundation of our belief if you do not or if you do not know the significance of the resurrection in your life then i think you are not a christian and you are still in your sins as paul have said and so if you have not really discovered the significance of the resurrection i believe that today is the right time for us to discover it for ourselves so for this afternoon's meditation i have chosen the text which has been clearly read to us from luke chapter 24 verses 13 to 35 and i want us to explore and see what really happened to these two disciples after the resurrection after the crucifixion of jesus and the subsequent event that has taken place for which they were unable to understand so before we go into the word of god shall we look to god in prayer almighty god we come before your presence in humility we want to thank you for your name is worthy to be praised we want to thank you for bringing us here together to worship you and we are so thankful as we reflect on all the things that you have done in our lives and especially the resurrection of our lord jesus christ who has conquered sin killed death condemnation and judgment and has given us redemption and eternal life father we want to thank you for your word and even as we reflect and meditate upon it let it come alive to us through your holy spirit and let it minister to us may we go out of this place with our hearts burning and stirred because we have encountered the risen lord bless us for we pray all this in the name of our lord and savior jesus christ amen so please turn with me to your text so here we see a story of two disciples walking to a village called emmaus now luke's gospel is considered or said to be the most beautiful book in the whole world and not only that here we see in order to prove that one of the most wonderful story that has taken place that resurrection day and this story as we will see is unique only in luke's gospel you will not found it anywhere else luke was a theologian and not only that he was also a historian and as he writes this story he has thoroughly investigated all the background and not only that he has used resources in order to validate his claim here and so we see the way that he starts his story see one of the disciple is mentioned his name is cleopas so this gives credibility to the story the other disciple is not named and according to some commentators probably this was cleopas wife whose name was mary and mary the wife of cleopas was with, was with mary magdalene during the crucifixion at the cross and you can see that in john chapter 19 now in the story we see that they were walking on the way to emmaus now if you read the gospel accounts what happened during the crucifixion what happened to the disciples the disciples were scattered all over some of them were in hiding and not only that we will see you know they were in confusion they were in despair they were dismayed their hopes were lost and the same thing has happened to these two disciples as they were walking on the way to emmaus now one 
significant thing that Luke is highlighting from this story, as you will see, is he highlights that the resurrected Jesus was revealed from the disciples. Well, Luke seems to be highlight that there is a prerequisite in order to encounter the risen Lord. Now, on the way to Emmaus, as the scripture says, you know, they were discussing all the things that has happened that week, the crucifixion of Jesus. And Jesus appears to them, as you will see in verse uh, 13 onwards. But very interestingly, they are unable to recognize Jesus. It seems Jesus, used, uh, Jesus was wearing a face mask that they were unable to identify him. And what is Luke's concern here? Or what is the gospel trying to indicate here? It is very clear that in order to recognize the risen Lord, there is something vital that they first need to understand. And this is not the only case here, but even Mary Magdalene, the other disciples were unable to identify the risen Lord at first. And you will see even in verse 36, uh, the following verse after 35, that the disciples were unable to recognize. And this gives a clear indication that there is something vital that we first need to know before we can encounter the risen Lord. Not only that, Luke seems to give a hint that the resurrected body or the resurrected Jesus was very, very different. An indication that the resurrected body that we will be getting is something going to be very different because it is going to be a transformed body. And now as they were going on the road, the risen Lord appears and walks before them and then inquires from them, you know, what was happening. And see the narration that starts from verse 17. Now they started to narrate all the events that has happened to Jesus. He was the one they were hoping who will come and redeem the people of Israel. He was the one whom they have hoped who will usher in the kingdom of God in which Israel will exist as an independent state. But all this has come to nothing because the, the, the Messiah, the one whom they have hoped to bring all this restoration and inaugurate this kingdom of God, he is now dead. He has been crucified. Probably they have been following Jesus for three years. They must have heard and listened to all his sermons about the kingdom of God that is about to come. And not only that, they must have witnessed all the miracles, the wonders that Jesus has done. But now all this has disappeared. All this has gone. And they must even have probably thought that Jesus was an imposter because during the time of Jesus, there were many imposters who were claiming to be the Messiah. If you read in Acts chapter uh, 5, there you will see two examples. Theodos is mentioned, Judas the Galilean, and Judas even had 400 disciples. But when they were put to death, all the disciples were scattered and the movement came to an end. And they believed that the same thing must have happened to this particular Messiah, Jesus, with whom, to whom they have believed. And as you see the text, see, they were going away from Jerusalem. And this, again, is very, very symbolic, because Jerusalem was the center where God was going to come and intervene in the life, in the nation of Israel. But now they are moving far away from Jerusalem because the king is dead. They were thinking that they were going to have the party of their lifetime, but now the party has ended prematurely because the horse was dead. And so this is the first indication that we see in this story. Now the second important point that Luke highlights is in verse 17 and verse 21. Luke here highlights a world without hope, a world without Christ, is a world without hope. See in verse 17, the state of the disciples. Their face was downcast, 
they were in despair, they were said. And not only that, in verse 21, they were in a state of hopelessness. And this is a very remarkable statement that they have made. We had hoped, but now all the low hopes were gone. All the hopes were lost. And this is the reality of the world without Christ. No matter how a person may look good on the outside, and whether a person is aware or not, this is the sad reality without Christ. And not only that, perhaps even for Christians, maybe this is the state that we are undergoing through at the moment. We have prayed for healing of a loved one, but that loved one died. We have prayed for broken relationship, but it has not happened. It has not healed. And we are in despair. We are hopeless. And friends, I tell you, if we do not understand the real significance of this Esther event, the same thing will happen to us. Problems, suffering, pain, affliction will come to us. And then we will soon give up hope. We will lose our hope. We will be in despair. We will enter into this depression, in desperation. And no wonder we know that even believers, they commit suicide. And the reason is when we do not understand the real significance of this Esther event. Now, this Esther message, the story about the resurrection, you know, really hits us especially when we are attending the funeral of our loved ones. In my family, you know, we have lost many loved ones, including my mother, through the years. And I can't imagine, you know, the state of hopelessness I will be in if that resurrection has not taken place. And because my hope is anchored in this Easter event that the resurrection has taken place, I know that the death is not the end. That is not the final word. And so for believers, this is very important. And so even uh, in our church, within this week also, we know family member, uh, our members have lost their family members. But we do not grieve like others without hope. But we grieve like those. We grieve, but we grieve like those who have hope. And so this is, again, one very important lesson that we need, we learn from this particular story, which Luke has highlighted. The third point that Luke highlights is that Christianity is not based on partial facts, but on the understanding of the whole story, the whole picture of God's plan of redemption. So Jesus comes alone, see verse 17, and inquires from them and see the response of the believers from verse 19. The two disciples actually knew a lot about Jesus. Here they, he says, they say, you know, he is a mighty prophet. And not only that, they have seen the words and the deeds which Jesus has performed. And not only that, they learned how the disciples, uh, the religious leaders, have put Jesus to death. And probably they must be thinking, you know, the religious leaders were right, and probably Jesus was an imposter. Not only that, they have heard the report from some of the women, okay, that the tomb is empty and Jesus has risen. But they are, they are dismissing this news as well, because as we will see from the text in verses 23 and 24, some of them went to the tomb, the tomb was empty, but they did not see him. And that's why they have even discounted that particular message. See, the cross has scattered. She's, they have shattered the hopes of the disciples. And not only that, they are in a state of disappointment. And the reason is because the way that they believed and understood Jesus was according to the popular belief of that time that the Messiah will come and restore the kingdom of Israel and will usher in the kingdom of God, especially for the people of Israel. Definitely, whatever they have believed was based on the scripture. 
But this is not all that the scripture says. And this is very clearly said in verse 25, where Jesus says, you believe the prophets, but not all what the prophets have said. So what they have done is, see, they have selected bits and pieces from the scripture and then believed them. They have taken parts of the scripture in order to conform to their desires and according to their needs, and they have believed in Jesus. And this was one of the downfall why they were under they failed to understand the real meaning of the crucifixion of Jesus. One of the famous New Testament scholar, Tom Wright, says, they were reading the scripture from the wrong end of the telescope. They were selective in the way that they understood scripture. And is this not true to many of the disciples, uh, believers today, many preachers, we are very selective in the way that we look into the scripture, just taking out bits and pieces in order to suit our need. And this has led into a lot of uh, desperation or disillusionment uh, at, the, at the best. And so this is a very, very important lesson for each and every one of us, that we should not base our understanding of Christ just on certain aspects of the scripture, but the whole of the scripture of what it says. And so for the members of NCF, what is the relevance of the scripture? What is the relevance of the gospel? Or what is the relevance of the resurrection in our lives? That's, that is a very important question that we need to ponder. The fourth point, Luke highlights the importance of Bible study. And now you will see in this particular story the greatest Bible study that Jesus conducted on that resurrection afternoon. Now the distance from Jerusalem to Emmaus is seven miles, and according to the calculation, it will take around two and a half hours if you walk slowly. And so probably Jesus was conducting the Bible study for around two hours. And so today I have uh, made my sermon two hours so that it will correspond to what Jesus was doing that day. Now, this is a very, very important aspect. See, the reason Lord did not make the, keep the disciples confused, but he took time in order to explain from what the scripture says all about. And as you will see uh, from verse 25 onwards, he rebukes them, and then he starts to point out the importance of why the cross is also a part and parcel of God's redemptive plan. Now the word redemption is used in this particular story. And if you look into the real meaning of what redemption is all about, it means to pay back at a cost. You take back something by paying a cost or a price. And this is exactly what God has done in Jesus Christ. And this is how Jesus explains to them. Jesus God was willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice, even the death of his son Jesus, so that he will redeem humanity from sin, guilt, and condemnation. And this was a very important lesson for them to understand. Now come to verse 27, see the way that he talks. He explains to them, all based on the scripture, meaning, from Genesis to Malachi, based on all the scripture, that's the word that is used here. So Jesus was explaining, not only from bits and parts, but from the beginning till the end. Though we don't have a record of what are the verses that he must have used, we can assume that he must have used all the important verses that talks about the work of Christ, how God was going to redeem humanity through the sacrifice of Jesus. And last Good Friday, we have read one of the important texts from Isaiah chapter 53. And not only that, see the end of it, he is not only to suffer the death on the cross, but through it, he was to be glorified. So not only the crucifixion of Jesus, but even the resurrection, the glorification is described in the scripture. And that is how Jesus explains it. 
And so this is a very important thing for us to understand, that we should understand or we should believe in Jesus Christ based on what the scripture says. Jesus shows to them, okay, that God's plan of redemption was much greater and deeper than they have understood to be. They had a very, very narrow understanding of what restoration is all about. But here we see Jesus explaining the whole purpose, plan, the scope of God's redemptive plan for us. Friends, we know that Easter was the greatest event or one of the greatest miracles that has taken place. And Jesus was there bodily with them. But see how the way Jesus has explained? He did not dwell on his own personality. He did not dwell on the witness of others, but he dwelled on the scripture. And this is one of the most important lessons that we can take out from this particular story. And I say this, and Luke has included this, because throughout the centuries, people will be confronted with this important question. Where and who is this risen Jesus, this risen Lord? And how do we respond to that? We meet, we encounter the risen Lord in the scripture. And this is a very important lesson uh, for us. Jesus did not want our faith, our confidence, to be based on some subjective experience, but he wanted it to be grounded on the word of God. The word of God, as we know, is eternal, is immutable, is under, unchangeable. And that's the reason whatever is said in the scripture has come to pass, and whatever is promised in the scripture has come to pass. And that's why the crucifixion has taken place. And that's why even the resurrection has taken place. And this is the explanation of Jesus, that we need to be, have our faith grounded in the word of God. And this is one important thing that I would like to emphasize on the, the members of NCF today, that the word of God is living. It is the place where we can encounter the risen Lord. And not only that, since many of you are youngsters, in schools and colleges who are members of NCF. The scripture should be the basis on which you define yourself, the basis on which you get your identity. Because many a times, what happens to youngsters? Your identity is defined according to the emotions that you undergo through, according to what people say you are. But your identity should be based on the scripture where it says, that you are made in the image of God. You are God's workmanship, made in Christ. And not only that, we have our eternity secured in him. And so one of the important lessons that we can take out here is that the scripture should be the central place for us believers, and that our faith should be, should be based on what the scriptures say. And especially for Naga Christians, this is very important, because many a times, you know, our faith is based, you know, on what people will say, especially as we know back home, prayer warriors or miracles. I am not condemning them. You know, they have their own place. But what Jesus says here is that our faith should first should be based on the scripture, on the unchangeable truth of the objective word of God and not based on subjective experience or emotions. The fifth point, Luke then highlights the table of the Lord in verse 28. As they drew near the village, Jesus was about to leave them, and the disciples invite them, invited him to their house. And not only that, uh, they invited him as a guest at the table. And the scripture says, Jesus becomes the host. And he took the bread, blessed them, you know, and gave it to them. And in that instance, their eyes were open. In that instance, they were able to recognize Jesus. Now, this is, again, a very, very important aspect. See, probably the disciples were not there at the Last Supper. But throughout the ministry of Jesus, table fellowship was one of the integral aspects of how Jesus, you know, communicated his message to the people. 
They must have seen the emblem of times, the gesture that he would make, you know, with his arms open, breaking the bread, sharing with them. And in this moment, they saw the nail scar hand. And they must probably have remembered the words, how many a times Jesus referred the bread to his body. And now they really understood how the bread has to be broken, symbolizing the body of Jesus, the sacrifice that he has to make. And in that instant movement, Jesus revealed himself to them, and they were able to recognize that this is indeed the risen Lord. And this is the significance of the Esther message. The cross is an integral part of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. And not only that, this is a picture of the future that we will be having. Luke probably is trying to portray or give us a foretaste of the messianic banquet that is going to take place with the, in the presence of God. Our future is defined. We are going to sup together. We are going to participate, fellowship together with the living God with the table that is widespread before us. You know, many a times, friends in UBS ask me, when are you going to invite us for barbecue? And I say, I don't know. My barbecue table is uncertain. But the table that God has prepared for us is open, is ready, and he is inviting each and every one of us. We will be fellowshipping together, in the presence of God, and not only that, with our loved ones who have gone before us and who is going to come after us. And this is the beauty, the message that Luke presents to us in this particular story. Now see verse 31. And then Jesus suddenly disappears. He is gone in a minute. And this is also another important part of the teaching that you will see in this particular story. This happened because Jesus was also preparing them how to manage or how to deal, you know, when he, was, when he was going to ascend to his father. They were to deal with the bodily absence of Jesus and in order to use them to an advantage. And this is, again, a very important part of the story that you will see in this particular gospel. It is only with the bodily ascension of Jesus that the Holy Spirit was about to come down upon the disciples. And this is what happens in the second volume that Luke writes in Acts, the day of Pentecost, where the Spirit came down and the disciples were able to experience the power of the resurrection. And this is clearly indicated even in this particular story of the two disciples. The second last point, Luke then highlights the experience of the disciples, see verse 32. Were not our hearts burning? And this is very significant the way that they say this. They did not say our hearts were burning because we saw the risen Lord. But see the way that the text says to us, our hearts were burning because he talked to us and he opened the scripture to us. When they received the illumination of the scripture, their hearts burned inside. When they understood the real sense, the meaning and purpose of why Christ had to die, then their, their, eye, uh, their eyes were open. And not only that, you know, their hearts were burning. Their hearts were burning. They were overwhelmed in order to learn the real meaning, the purpose of why Jesus had to die on the cross. You know, some years back, one of our friends, he became a Christian, and one day he came to me, and he said, you know, I have committed so many wrong things in my life, and how is it possible for me, you know, uh, for me to be accepted by God just like that? And I took him through the scripture, you know, making him understand, and I could see the glow in his face. He was overwhelmed, you know, that how God can forgive uh, such a sinner like him. And the same thing we can see, the experience that uh, the disciples underwent. 
And this is exactly how we believers, you know, should experience when we read the scripture, when we meditate upon the scripture. It should stir our hearts. Our hearts should burn. And so as, I, as we observe this Esther Sunday, I want to encourage each and every member today that let us regularly read the scripture, meditate upon it, and then we will encounter the risen Lord. And then our hearts will be stirred, our hearts will glow, and then our hearts will burn within us. The last point, Luke highlights the transformation that took place in the life of the disciples. Their lives were transformed for a purpose, for a mission. See verse 33. They walked all the way seven miles to their village. And when they recognized Jesus, what happened? They immediately stood up and went back to Jerusalem in order to proclaim the good news. And this response is the standard response that you will see throughout the scripture. The women disciples did the same. And not only that, in this particular story, the disciples themselves did the same. They proclaimed the good news. So the disciples went back to Jerusalem in order to tell the story. And as the, we can see in the story, before they could even share about the risen Lord, the disciples narrated, proclaimed the good news to them. The Lord has risen. This is a very, very important lesson for each and every one of us. Our lives should be transformed when we encounter the risen Lord. And not only that, we should have the zeal to proclaim the gospel. This is the authentic mark of a true believer who have encountered the risen Lord. There should be a zeal. Our hearts should be burning in order to go and tell about the resurrected Lord. Friends, there are so many people who are without hope, in desperation, even among our family members. Please don't lose time. There should be an urgency in order to go and tell them about the risen Lord. Not only that, you know, our life is very short. We never know when our time will come. And so we should take every opportunity to go and tell this particular message of hope, of eternity to them. And if we let them go without hearing this message, you know, we will always regret and it will be a loss for them as well for eternity. And so in conclusion, we have seen all the important lessons from this particular story about these two disciples, how they encountered the risen Lord. Indeed, the Lord is risen. And this is one of the most wonderful, one of the most powerful, significant proclamation in history. Sin, death, condemnation, you know, they are all, they are not the last word. But in place of that, we have salvation, we have eternal life, we have redemption, we have reconciliation. Because Christ has risen. The disciples were in doubt, they were in despair, they had no hope, but when they encountered the risen Lord, their lives were transformed, their hopes were restored. And I believe and I pray that this will be the same experience for each and every one of us seated here today, that our hopes will be restored and that our lives will be transformed. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Almighty God, we want to thank you so much for your presence with us this afternoon. Father, when we think about all the things that you have done for us through your son, Jesus Christ, when we really reflect on who Jesus really is and truly is, indeed, our hearts are filled with gratitude. We want to thank you for your living word through who, which we can encounter and meet the risen Lord. Help each and every one of us, Father, to be counted in this principle. Because when we encounter you, Lord, our lives will never be same. Help us to be like those disciples who were ready to go and proclaim the good news to people around. Help us to have that zeal 
to take this significant message of victory, of triumphant victory over sin, of eternity, of eternal life, and for, of all the promises that you have promised to each one of you because Christ has risen. Thank you so much once again for your presence with us and for speaking to us. Thank you so much for bringing us into the fellowship through your son, Jesus Christ. Keep us united in him who was dead but is now alive forevermore. Amen. Father, we are so much blessed and with all the good things that we have received today, we'll be moving out from here. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit may raise and abide with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you.